We use computers every single day, from desktops, laptops, tablets, and smartphones. But in many ways, we've become almost oblivious to how they actually work. The user interfaces used across all of these operating systems have become intuitive and almost anonymous to us. When you look at your Windows PC, your Mac or Linux machine, and indeed your Android or iOS device, you are looking at the collective sum total of years of software and hardware progress and development to reach the current look and feel you see before you. So in many ways, the features we take for granted were in one day very alien concepts to those early computing pioneers. The modern OS has come from somewhere. And in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about how history has given birth to the modern operating system. This is the history of the operating system. Let's go back in time to the invention of digital computers. They could handle around 5,000 complex calculations per second. Impressive for the time, but today's supercomputers perform nearly 34 trillion calculations per second. Programs were written on punch cards, pieces of cardboard with holes. These were fed one at a time into the central processing unit, or CPU and enabled the earliest form of computer batch processing. In some cases, one person was in charge of making sure the cards were fed in correctly. Their job was to correct jams and schedule when the next program could be run. As computers became faster, they were able to process punch card tasks quicker than the cards could be fed in. There was another problem different computers' resources. That is, the components within them, such as RAM, and the devices attached to them, such as printers, were all different from one another. A programmer had to write very different types of programs specific to the machine it would be running on. It's all getting a bit complicated, isn't it? In the 1960s, IBM were the leading computer hardware vendor and developed the OS 360. But it wasn't until later in the decade that the rise of Unix would change everything. AT&T Bell Laboratories developed the system for their old PDP-7 mini computer. By today's standards, there was nothing mini about it, but back then, a computer that didn't take up half a room was considered small. It cost $72,000. It used flip chip technology and would support a keyboard, printer, paper tape, and dual transport deck tape drives. By today's standards, it had a memory capacity of just nine kilobytes. But of course, back then, memory wasn't measured in bytes. It was measured in words, of which it could store only 4,000. Unix proved popular because it was easy to obtain, easily modified, and completely free. The 1970s would bring us 8-bit processors, including the Intel 8080, a precursor to the 386 processor, and later the Intel 486. But it wasn't until the 1980s that we started to see a giant leap in computing development. This was because it had finally become commercially viable to produce smaller computers for the home. These included the Commodore 64, the Apple II series, the Atari 8-bit machine, and of course, who could forget? the ZX Spectrum. In 1981, Xerox introduced the Star Office Information System, which would ultimately prove revolutionary because it gave Apple the idea to produce a GUI, graphical user interface, based operating system for the first time and include mouse-based input. This was the first time anyone had ever seen icons represent files and folders on a computing system. We take it for granted now, but back then that was highbrow stuff and a lot of people found it very difficult to actually get to grips with. Even to this day, you can still see where modern operating systems take their design cues and their general conventions and behaviors from all the work that Xerox did back in the day. It gave us terms like desktop and property settings, but also delete, copy, and move functions. To this day, we still owe the majority of these breakthroughs to Xerox, and not Apple or Microsoft. Of course, at this time, Microsoft DOS and PC DOS sold on IBM computers was the market leader and would remain relatively intact beneath Windows 95, 98, and Millennium as a software compatibility mode for older applications. Backing things up a little bit though, it was Apple's Lisa Office system in 1983 that gave us the first graphical user interface based operating system that was commercially viable. As you can see, it bears a striking resemblance to Xerox interpretation. However, Lisa was way too expensive for the average consumer and the machine itself 
was a commercial failure. Later, Apple would develop System 1.0 in 1984 for the original Macintosh, and then everything changed. Even today, you can see that the first Mac operating system has some striking similarities to what we use today. The Apple logo, the general layout of folders, the taskbar at the top, and the trash can in the bottom right-hand corner. In many ways, it's kind of like a primitive version of OS X, or more accurately, more like OS 9, but you can still see that Apple have retained the general layout of their desktop operating system after all these years. Microsoft would copy Apple in developing Windows, and of course Windows 95 was the biggest operating system of the 90s. When you look at these operating systems developed by Microsoft and Apple, over the years, although a lot's changed, in many ways they still retain the same design elements and UI conventions that we see today. But of course, operating systems have evolved beyond the mouse and keyboard. With the advent of touchscreen devices and social media, operating systems have begun to go through their next major evolution. Now, social media networks pervade desktop environments with reminders and notifications. They've become far more simplified and appliance-like. Users expect them to be ever more intuitive and easier to use with all of the complexity and technology hidden away from them. We take so many of the great features and functions of our operating systems today for granted, and it can be all too easy to forget where the ingenuity and creativity actually came from. There's no doubt that the operating systems of today are light years ahead of what we had in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But the fundamental principles and core commitment to meet the user's needs and recognize the importance of breaking down the barrier between the hardware and the software and the human interface remains an evolving project. We can only speculate where operating systems will be in the next 10 or 20 years, but one thing's for sure, wherever we're headed, the progress we make will be built on a mountain of developmental successes and failures made by those first computing pioneers from the dawn of the computing age.